the name Galileo evokes many memories and images in people's minds. We think of the satellites of Jupiter. We think of astronomers peering through the telescopes. We think of astronauts flying in the space. We think of modern satellites sent under Galileo's name. But the most controversial has been his standing before the inquisitors in Rome. These days, we hear a lot about war between science and religion. Galileo affair is the most often cited example in such an argument. Recently, I was in Italy visiting Florence and Rome. I can't help but think of Galileo. When I visited the beautiful city of Florence, I went to Arcetri to see the home where Galileo lived. Let me give you some raw facts about Galileo before we discuss Galileo's trouble with the church. Galileo was born on February 15, 1564 in the Italian state of Pisa in West Central Italy. His parents, Vincenzo and Gula Galilei, taught him to sing and practice music. Even in the music he was playing, Galileo saw mathematical formulas like uh, Pythagorean rules. In 1581, he enrolled in the University of Pisa to study medicine but later shifted to mathematics. In 1585, the 21-year-old Galileo left the University of Pisa without earning his degree. In 1589, Galileo joined University of Pisa as professor of mathematics. And then from 1592 to 1610 at the University of Padua. In Padua, Galileo met Marina Gamba and their union produced three children. Basically, that's a brief summary of his life. When we think of Galileo, we think of starry heavens, ocean tides, telescopes, mathematical formulas, inquisition, etc., etc. But one tender aspect of his life was the constant attention he paid to his three children. In her book, Galileo's Daughter, a historical memoir of science, faith, and love, author Dava Sobel wrote, Thus all the while that Galileo was inventing modern physics, teaching mathematics to princes, discovering new phenomena among the planets, publishing science books for the general public, and defending his bold theories against establishment enemies. He was also buying thread for Sur Luza, choosing organ music for Mother Achillea, shipping gifts of food, and supplying his homegrown citrus fruits, wine, and rosemary leaves for the kitchen and apothecary at San Matteo." End quote. You may be a great scientist with magnificent ideas that span the entire universe, but can you take some time to attend the needs of a child or a parent or a friend? Galileo's name is also connected to Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem but grew up in Galilee. The name Galileo is derived from the land of Galilee where Jesus grew up. Galileo remained a follower of Christ throughout his life and he took his faith seriously. He attended the church almost every week and made many scientific observations while walking in the church. Galileo tried to analyze every object in mathematical terms. He was inspired by Archimedes, the greatest uh, mathematician of antiquity. The ancient mathematicians like Euclid investigated conic sections, the shapes produced by the intersection of a plane and a cone. 2000 years later, Galileo realized that these shapes describe the paths followed by free falling objects in a gravitational field. However, he did not confine himself by the aesthetics of mathematical models. He performed experiments to prove his uh, scientific theories. Galileo challenged Aristotle's ideas that captivated the Western intellectuals for over 1600 years with one of the simplest 
at most profound experiments of all time, rolling marbles down an inclined plane, he turned natural philosophy upside down. His principle of inertia, principle of relativity, and the law of free fall became the foundation for everything that later came in the science of gravity, including Einstein's theory of relativity. Galileo throwing two objects of different masses from the top of the leaning tower of Pisa has been a familiar staple in high school physics, but there is no evidence he really conducted this experiment. However, he experimented with falling and rolling objects and uh, pointed out that objects with different masses fall at the same rate. When air resistance is negligible, a heavier object does not fall faster than a lighter one. The genius of Galileo and the beauty of his principle was demonstrated before the modern world by an astronaut on the moon with a hammer and a feather. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings and on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, <laughs> that proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Both hammer and feather reached the ground at the same time. Isaac Newton was born the year Galileo died. Newton was motivated by Galileo when he formulated his famous law of universal gravitation. Galilean relativity teaches that the physical laws remain unchanged in all constant velocity reference frames. Galileo also studied the inertia of objects, that is the property of uh, matter by which it continues to uh, exist in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless that state is changed by an external force, that's basically inertia. 300 years later, Albert Einstein analyzed Galileo's principle of relativity and the principle of inertia while he was working on his theory of relativity. Peering into the heavens through his modified telescope, Galileo observed astounding things never before seen by any human being. He discovered dark spots on the surface of the sun. On the moon he saw chains of mountains and valleys. There is no doubt that Galileo was one of the greatest scientists ever lived. More than everything else we have seen above, we remember Galileo for challenging the Roman Catholic Church with his theory of heliocentric astronomy. This we call Galileo's affair. Now Galileo affair can be divided into two phases. The first phase from 1613 to 1616 and the second phase from 1632 to 1633. First let us see phase 1 in the years between 1613 to 1616. In 1613, Galileo wrote his famous letter to Grand Duchess Christina arguing that the Bible had to be interpreted in the light of scientific knowledge. Now let me tell you a few things about Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas started a tradition called scholasticism. Scholasticism added the ideas of Plato and Aristotle and Ptolemy to Christian theology. So scholastics took Aristotle and uh, Ptolemy's geocentric theory and added it to church doctrine. 
so when galileo started to preach his heliocentric theory he was attacking scholasticism not the bible or christian faith nowhere in the bible will you find that the earth is at the center of the solar system that idea came into catholic church through scholasticism of thomas aquinas the church did not want to give up scholasticism and then started the trouble on december 21 1614 a dominican priest tomaso cassini condemned galileo from the pulpit of the church of santa maria novella in florence the central figure in the first phase was cardinal bellarmine he was one of the most powerful churchmen in rome he served as inquisitor in the trial of giordano bruno he was called hammer of the heretics bellarmine was representing pope paul v who had devoted his papacy to implementing council of trent reforms now council of trent was intended to suppress martin luther's protestant reformation the pope and the catholic church they were fighting to suppress protestant reformation and here comes galileo a devout catholic challenging the church and he was seen more dangerous than martin luther and john calvin the cardinals under pope paul v they denounced copernican heliocentrism as formally heretical and foolish and absurd on february 26 the inquisition summoned galileo to the palace of lord cardinal bellarmine now galileo and bellarmine knew each other for from meetings over 15 years now please listen carefully galileo's ideas came from the heliocentric model proposed by copernicus in 1543 heliocentric theory was revolutionary but it did not provide any improvement in predictive power over the geocentric model bellarmine told galileo show me some proof to support heliocentric theory but galileo could not provide convincing proof Galileo believed that the most irrefutable proof of the Copernican system was his theory of tides. His claim that the tides in the oceans are caused by motion of the earth is completely wrong. His telescopic proofs, the satellites of Jupiter and the phases of Venus are not conclusive. That is important to note. Although Galileo was right in espousing heliocentrism he was wrong to claim he had proof of it he was also caught in a power struggle between dominicans and jesuits the two prominent religious orders of the catholic church the dominican preachers they tried to suppress galileo while jesuits supported him and in fact they verified galileo's telescopic observations so finally as pope's representative bellarmine warned galileo not to continue to hold copernicanism as literally true and galileo agreed so the first phase of uh, galileo affair ended with a verbal warning from cardinal bellarmine then for the next 15 years galileo lived a peaceful life and he got into trouble again in 1632 and 1633 he published his book dialogue concerning the two chief world systems in 1632 in florence the book has three characters and these three characters they talk to each other in the city of venice there is sagridus an intelligent layman there is salvietus who speaks for the other galileo and simplicus a simpleton representing aristotle's school of thought through their three mouths galileo expounded his ideas of a lifetime in science philosophy and theology mafio barberini pope urban 8 takes a prominent role in the second phase of Galileo affair. Barberini 
befriended Galileo and supported him in different debates before he was elevated to the highest office in Rome. Barberini esteemed Galileo highly and had discussed science with him both in Florence and in Rome. Barberini was elected Pope Urban VIII in 1623. Galileo went to Rome in the spring of 1624 and met his old friend. Urban VIII welcomed him and praised the assayer which Galileo dedicated to Urban. They discussed the Earth's motion and heliocentric theory. In fact, the Pope said that uh, Galileo could write about it with one caveat. Galileo should add a disclaimer to his theory. Because God is omnipotent, we can never be certain about the ultimate causes underlying various natural phenomena. So, when Galileo sat down to write dialogue, he put Pope's argument only on the last page of the book and also into the mouth of this fool, Simplicio. Pope Urban VIII saw that as a betrayal and he was furious with Galileo. I have been betrayed, I have been deceived. He felt he was insulted by Galileo to see his uh, rational propositions as mindless babblings in the mouth of Simplicio. So once his dearest friend, now the Pope became a bitterest enemy of Galileo. Galileo received summons from Rome. He pleaded for time and clemency, but finally arrived in Rome in February 1633. For five months, Galileo was questioned by the inquisitors. Their accusations surrounded Galileo's 1616 agreement with Bellarmine. The legal case was not about heliocentrism. It was rather, did Galileo violate the terms of his 1616 agreement with Bellarmine? The inquisitors produced a document from 1616 in which Galileo agreed not to discuss Copernicanism but it was not notarized and it did not bear Galileo's signature. In fact, Galileo was surprised when he saw that document and he maintained he had never seen it. He also presented the Bellarmine certificate, which stated that he had notified Galileo that the doctrine attributed to Copernicus cannot be defended or held. The words teach and discuss in whatsoever were not in the certificate, nor was there any mention of a formal injunction. So, Galileo argued that he did not really believe that heliocentrism was true, but was trying to make a weak argument look strong. On January 22, 1633, Galileo was moved to the large hall of a monastery in the center of Rome. He was made to kneel on the floor. The inquisitors read him the sentence, and I quote, We say, pronounce, sentence, and declare that you, Galileo, for the things found in the trial and confessed by you, have made yourself vehemently suspected of heresy, namely to have held and believed false doctrine, contrary to the holy and divine scriptures. We are agreeable that you will be absolved, provided that first with sincere heart and unfeigned faith, you abjure, curse and detest the above mentioned errors and heresies. We order that the book, the dialogue by Galileo Galilei be prohibited by public edict. We condemn you to formal prison and we impose on you as salutary penances that for the next three years you say the seven penitential psalms once a week and a court. Even though many images of this trial show Galileo sitting before the judges, actually he was kneeling before his judges and then he abjured the earth's motion. The Pope's nephew, Francesco Barberini, and two other cardinals, 
did not sign the conviction. What does it tell us? This was a short trial. We condemn you to formal prison. Based on these words, some people portrayed Galileo being drawn in chains to a dark dungeon where he was confined the rest of his life. No food, no drink. He was slowly emaciating and becoming blind. The truth is, Galileo did not go to prison. His prison sentence was immediately commuted to house arrest. He spent a week in the Villa Medici, a sumptuous palace in Rome, and then released it to the custody of his friend Archbishop Ascanio Piccolomini in Siena. For about five months, the two friends they worked on new scientific projects. Despite restrictions that Galileo should have no visitors, Ascanio invited many visitors to the palace. Finally, in December 1633, the Pope allowed Galileo to return to his villa in Florence instead of going to prison. Galileo spent the rest of his life in perpetual house arrest in his villa in Arcetri. Urban wanted Galileo to suffer as little as possible and continued the pension he had allocated when their friendship was in full blossom. Despite the house arrest, Galileo was delighted to be home and near his beloved daughter, sister Maria Celeste. People like Milton came and visited him. So that is the truth. Galileo did not go to prison but was confined to his villa on the beautiful slopes of Arcetri in Florence. Galileo was very happy to be with his daughter who was actually a nun. Her name was Sister Maria Celeste. She suddenly fell ill and died at only 33 years of age. Her death in April 1634 was a painful loss to Galileo. But he saw the hand of God even in that pain. He said these words, I quote, Whatever the course of our lives, we should receive them as the highest gift from the hand of God, in which equally reposed the power to do nothing whatever for us. Indeed, we should accept misfortune not only in thanks but infinite gratitude to providence which by such means detaches us from an excessive love for earthly things and elevates our minds to the celestial and the divine. So you see folks, how Galileo took that tragedy. Contrast that how Darwin reacted to the death of his beloved daughter Annie. When Annie died in 1851, Darwin was stricken with so much grief that he could not even attend her funeral and burial at Malwa. Whatever faith in God that persisted as a vestige in Darwin's life, it evaporated when Annie took her last breath. When his little daughter died in the survival of the fittest world he created, Darwin could not see the contradiction of raging against a benevolent God. You see, folks, that's very important. In evolutionary worldview, there is no hope when a loved one dies. But in Christian worldview, there is hope that goes beyond the grave. We see that in the life of Galileo, Galileo died in Arcetri near Florence on January 8, 1642, after suffering from heart palpitations and fever. His final resting place is in Santa Croce, across from Michelangelo's tomb. As his pupil Viviani wrote, I quote, with philosophic and Christian firmness, he rendered up his soul to its creator sending it, as he liked to believe, to enjoy and to watch from a closer vantage point those eternal and immutable marvels which he, by means of a fragile device, had brought closer to our mortal eyes with such eagerness and impatience. Galileo was a great scientist and the father of modern astronomy. He can be described as a Martin Luther of science. Near the end of his life, Albert Einstein once said, 
the theme that I recognize in Galileo's work is the passionate fight against any kind of dogma based on authority. In what we call scholasticism, Thomas Aquinas corrupted Christian theology with Roman and Greek paganism and natural philosophy with Roman and Greek geocentric astronomy. While Martin Luther started his crusade against scholasticism in theology, Galileo waged his war against scholasticism in natural philosophy. Instead of Latin, the language of scholars, Luther wrote his books in German and Galileo wrote his books in Italian because they wanted to reach the ordinary people with their ideas and ideals. Through Council of Kent, Roman Catholic Church wanted to suppress both Protestant Reformation and Scientific Revolution. Both Martin Luther and Galileo realized that their fight was against the false ideas came from Greeks and Romans, not God and the Bible. Both Luther and Galileo stayed as devout Christians throughout their lives. So to summarize, in Galileo, we find a great scientist who loved both God and science. He wanted Christians to leave the obsolete natural philosophy of Aristotle and Ptolemy and embrace the scientific method born out of induction and deduction. No serious historian of science today would use Galileo affair as a war between science and religion. Galileo did not become an atheist he stayed a Christian throughout his life. Galileo would be a great inspiration for young students and scientists who want to glorify God through science and technology. Thank you.